Okay, well, thank you very much, and, and it's great to see such a, a, a big turnout. Okay, in the interest of time, we'll just jump right in here if I can make the technology work. Changed on my screen, but not yours. I have wonderful slides, really. Just picture the most amazing slides you've ever seen in your life. I, oh, there we go. Okay, I'd like to start with the story. Um, I spent a lot of time as uh, in my youth out on the water, mostly in Algonquin Park in central Ontario, as you can see here, and looking quite cool, I might add. Um, I, uh, I've always been interested in birds, as, as was pointed out. Um, but due to my time out on the water when I was young, I got especially interested in water birds. And uh, a little later on here, I've sprouted a beard, and uh, my dad and I are doing water bird surveys in some marsh someplace. Great times, and I've always found my time out in marshes and out on lakes um, over the years, I've always found it very special um, in a way that's hard to put to words. But Luckily, an audience such as yourself knows exactly firsthand what I'm, what I'm trying to describe, especially because uh, many of you in the room will spend, uh, spend time, lots of time birding, especially around the water. Um, I took that love of water birds to heart later on and did one of my graduate degrees working on marsh birds. Uh, and as proof of that, here's a 23-year-old me on the front cover of the very first report that the Marsh Monitoring Program of Bird Studies Canada put out, get this, 17 years ago now. Hard to believe that that much time has gone by, but it's true. And over the years, I've noticed a number of changes. Um, for example, the photograph that I took on the front cover of that same report, you can see it blown up at the top there, it appears a little bit farther up um, from the picture of me. Um, I took that picture at the base of Long Point, in the early 2000s. And I went out there a couple of weeks ago and took a picture at exactly the same spot, and that's the image that you see in the background. So there's exactly 17 years between the photo at the top and the photo in the background. And you can see what a change that's happened. Um, I bet there's probably some folks in the audience tonight that knows this location. It's just um, to the west of the causeway as you head out onto the point. And in the early 2000s, when I took the photo at the top, this was an excellent place to observe water birds. Open water, mud flats, is great for shorebirds. But when you look at it now, it's completely choked with vegetation. A uh, completely different location. And a lot of that vegetation is non-native invasive phragmites or common reed grass. And we will talk more about that a little later on. So, you know, being out on the water or birding around the water and noticing these major changes that are happening and wondering how those changes affect birds and other wildlife is really what brings us together uh, here tonight. But before we dive into that, I really should take some time and explain a little bit about Bird Studies Canada, just to convey who we are and what we do and to better sort of describe where tonight's program is coming from. Now, many, I know many of you in the audience are familiar with Bird Studies Canada and what we do, but I'm just gonna take a few moments and describe that just so that we're all uh, aware and on the same page. So Bird Studies Canada, you know, in a nutshell, we're the number one go-to organization for anything to do with bird monitoring and conservation in Canada. There's our mission at the top. This is our national headquarters at the base of Long Point. But we also have staff in various places right across the country. In any particular day, what we do falls into three main categories, like you can see on our website here. Citizen science, research and conservation, and education. Our education program targets you know, youth and school groups and urban groups. And our research and conservation programs target trying to answer timely questions of conservation interest. And for that, we often um, partner with academic institutions, you know, universities and stuff like that, and do uh, targeted field research to answer those questions. But what we're really known for is our citizen science. We have over 40 citizen science programs now. There's at least one operating in every province and territory right up across Canada. And remarkably, almost 50,000 people um, participate in these programs every year, including, I'm sure, many of you in the audience tonight. Okay, so back to changes on the water. Um, you know, human-induced changes are happening all over the place, um, but they're more intense and they're more severe in certain places than others. And you know, in, turn, in a, the context of the Great Lakes Basin, these stressors and changes that we're hearing about in, in the lower Great Lakes as of late 
least, especially in the media. Um, they're most intense in the lower Great Lakes, i.e. Lake Erie and Lake Ontario, and especially in Lake Erie itself. And that's uh, why we'll focus on Lake Erie tonight. So here's what I'd like to cover. First, an overview of where the Great Lakes are most stressed, or let the cat out of the bag there. It's you know, Lake Erie, Lake Ontario, and especially Lake Erie uh, in particular. Then what birds use Lake Erie and why? Obviously in a, um, an audience such as this, most of you will have a very good idea of the, uh, the answer to that question, but we'll uh, look at it nonetheless just so we're all on the same page. And then the meat and the potatoes of the presentation will really be to focus on how some of the stressors and the changes that we're seeing in the lake recently, uh, how, how those are affecting birds. And then at the end, I'll try to pull it all together, pull out some take home messages and make some kind of overall conclusion. So first, you know, just where are the lakes most stressed? This is a really good illustration. A bunch of scientists got together and mapped the cumulative stress in the open part of each of the, of the Great Lakes. So the, the, they basically made a list of every stressor you could possibly think of. You know, habitat loss, invasive species, pollutants, and uh, you, you, know, you name it, it went in there. And there's, there's the map. So red is really stressed and blue is not so stressed. And you know, you can see it, Lake, the lower Great Lakes, Lake Erie, Lake Ontario, lots of red, really stressed there. Um, same for Lake Michigan, really. And then Lake Huron, you know, getting a little better. There's certainly some places that are stressed, but there's more blue there. And of course, as you go farther north to Lake Superior, things get better. Here's another depiction. Um, same kind of thing, a bunch of scientists got together and made a big list, but this one focuses on the adjacent watersheds rather than the lake itself, like we saw in the last image. And so this looked at things like urban and rural, um, urban and agricultural land use, sorry, uh, population density, road density, that kind of stuff in the adjacent landscape. And again, you can see you know, Lake Erie, lots of red, really stressed. Lake Ontario, same kind of story, but not so much. And then as you move north, you know, things get much better, less stressed towards Lake Superior. Here's yet another depiction. This one again, a bunch of scientists, including some of us at Bird Studies in Canada, got together and looked at the response of various things to the stressors we saw depicted in the last two images. So this included things like contaminants in wildlife themselves, um, the abundance of different groups of wildlife, like birds and frogs and things like that in different lakes, and then wrapped it up into one overall status for each lake. And of course, there you can see it. Lake Erie is in the red. And the trend over time in that status is deteriorating, shown by the backwards arrow. And you know, Lake Michigan, Huron, uh, Ontario, you know, fair, a little bit better in terms of stress and not changing. And then, of course, you go north and it's less stressed in Lake Superior. So, you know, overall here, you know, this tells us the lower Great Lakes are really stressed, and in particular, Lake Erie. But you know, is it really all bad in terms of birds? You know, yes, we've got these added stressors and we hear a lot about Lake Erie in the media lately for, for various uh, reasons um, in terms of these changes. But is it bad news for all birds? Or maybe, just maybe, are there some groups of birds that are maybe benefiting from some of these stresses and changes? You know, that would be kind of nice. Maybe there's a good news story in here somewhere. So that's what we really uh, will uh, try and tease out here uh, tonight. But first, let's just quickly take a look before we dive into all that as to what birds use Lake Erie and why. Like I mentioned before, you know, all of you, all, most of you, if not all of you, have first-hand knowledge of, of birds that use Lake Erie because you, you likely go birding or have been birding there. Um, Lake Erie is basically known for, to birds for two reasons, nesting and migration. So nesting and migrating birds. Here's some of the nesting birds that are of note. Um, there's a variety of different species that nest in coastal marshes around the edge of Lake Erie. Uh, you know, things like black tern and common gallinule, and king rail, leaf spittern. And you'll notice, you know, these marsh nesting birds are all listed with, to some, so, with some degree of at-risk status. So Lake Erie is um, a special stronghold for some of these uh, nesting species that are, that are at risk. The other uh, big thing, Lake Erie, you know, is, is important for in terms of birds are, are migrating birds. So both going north, you know, in the spring, going south in the fall. And the two big groups, you know, waterfowl, here's a big raft of scop, and, uh, and shorebirds. So these, these two groups especially uh, congregate at various places around the edge of the lake. They stop here during migration and they fuel up uh, on food and continue on their way. And Lake Erie is very important that way. 
And just to illustrate the importance of the lake, here for the Canadian side of the lake, you can see important bird and biodiversity areas as designated by Bird Studies Canada through our global partner, BirdLife International. And you know, there they are, the orange blobs. And these are places that are especially important for nesting or in most uh, cases for large numbers of migrating stopover, birds stopping over to fuel up on their migrations. And these are the kinds of places you all recognize, probably because you've been birding there, you know, Long Point, Rondo, Peely, Holiday Beach, and the Detroit River. So, you know, we've seen the lower Great Lakes really stressed, especially Lake Erie, and we've seen that Lake Erie is really important for nesting and migrating birds. Now we can move on and look at those core questions. Notice, are these recent stressors and changes really all bad for all birds, or, or maybe just maybe, is there a good news story buried in this somewhere? And in doing that, we have a huge challenge ahead of us. And, and this is the challenge. There's a lot of stressors. There's a whole long list of them. This is just one study's depiction of some of the stressors that might be affecting Lake Erie. And they all have these complicated interactions with each other. I mean, we've only got 25 minutes left here or something. We can't cover all of these stressors. What are we gonna do? And to make things even more challenging, Lake Erie is really three lakes in one. There's the Western Basin, the Central, and the Eastern Basin. That's why, especially in the media lately, you've been hearing a lot about harmful algal blooms, you know, blue-green algae, cyanobacteria, uh, in, you know, having implications for drinking water quality for, for people. And that's depicted in the map here on the bottom right. You know, these harmful algal blooms happen in the western basin a lot, and if they get really big, they kind of creep into the central basin, and they don't really happen much at all on a large scale in the eastern basin. The reason for that is the three different basins are quite different in terms of water depth, and the nature and composition of the runoff that's coming off of the surrounding landscape into the lake. So we have all the variation from these three lakes in one on top of there being many different stressors and all these complicated interactions. And of course, just briefly, we won't talk direct about this tonight, but of course these harmful algal blooms, as you've been hearing about in the media, are being caused by recent changes that have happened due to climate change, the idea is that more intense late winter and early spring storms wash um, you know, phosphorus and down into the lake off the land, and that's what's fueling these harmful algal blooms. So here's what I propose we do. We get all these stressors and we don't have time to talk about all of them. Let's just pick three and focus on those. So I suggest we, we focus on non-native invasive Phragmites or common reed grass and how it affects marsh nesting birds. And we'll take a look at how contaminated uh, zebra and coaga mussels affect mussel-eating ducks. And third, how type B botulism affects loons and waterfowl. So for each of these ones, we'll go through and we'll take a look at what causes the stressor in the first place and how it affects individual birds. We'll do that for each of the three, and then at the end, we'll take a look at some of Bird Studies Canada's citizen science data from some of our programs and see if there's population level uh, effects on these three uh, groups from these three stressors. So first, Phragmites, um, a non-native uh, invasive species introduced from Europe, got established in Lake Erie during a period of really low water level. You can see in the graph the blue line, which is the average water level in the lake over the years. You can see it really went low in the late 90s, and that's when the Phragmites germinated and really got established. It needs the water to go low, expose a bunch of mudflats and coastal wetlands. That's when it get, got established from the seed bank. And then even though the waters come back up, as you can see by the blue line coming back up in more recent years, you can see the Phragmites has continued to spread, shown by the orange line, which is the average coverage in some study plots around the edge of the lake. And you can see this, the spread in this map, which only shows data for the U.S. side, there's no Canadian data on here, but you can see, you know, there's Phragmites pretty much all along the south side of the lake, according to this U.S. data and some of the other Great Lakes as well. This stuff is spread, and even though the water levels come back up, the plants are tall, they've germinated, they've become established, they can get inundated again, and it doesn't bother them. So it's pretty much here to stay, even though the water levels come back up. The problem with Phragmites is that our marsh nesting birds just play on the not like it. They choose far fewer territories in it. And the problem seems to be it just grows too thick. It's not a problem for these marsh nesting birds to necessarily squeeze their way through the stuff, I don't think, because rails and, and some of these marsh nesting birds are really good at doing that. 
I think the problem mainly is that the Phragmites fills in little pools and canals and openings that these birds really like, especially for foraging and for feeding during the breeding season. They, it fills all that in. In native vegetation patches like cattail and grass sedge and you know, bulrush and things like that, you get far more openings in canals and, and little places where they can feed, whereas those get filled in completely by the Phragmites. And so, you know, this is what marsh managers and scientists, they talk about interspersion. You know, a marsh is interspersed, and that's the interspersion between the open water and the emergent vegetation. And in Phragmites, in a wetland that's been taken over by this stuff, you just don't have you know, virtually no interspersion. And marsh birds don't like that. Just to illustrate the extent of the problem, just take the Crown Marsh at Long Point. There's probably some of you in the, in the audience who's birded here. It's a great spot. Um, what you're seeing here is a, a map from 1999 and another one from 2016 showing the extent of Phragmites in the marsh, shown by the white blobs, the white polygons. You see in 1999, the Phragmites was just getting established you know, on the shoreward side of the marsh. And this is one of the sites that I studied for one of my graduate degrees. And I worked in this marsh in 2000. You know, there was a few patches of Phragmites, and there was all kinds of marsh birds. It was a great spot. Fast forward to 2016. You can see Phragmites has pretty much taken over the whole marsh, and the number of marsh birds here has, has dropped because of it, at least in part because of it. And you can tell the same kind of story for just about, for countless different marshes all around the edge of Lake Erie, and even some of the other uh, lower lakes as well. Just to drive the point home of just how much of a problem this is, this study came out very recently done at Long Point, including the Crown Marsh. What the researchers did, there's two graphs here. The one on the left shows the number of species. And the one on the right shows the abundance for marsh nesting birds of conservation concern. So these are things like you see at the top there, American and least bitter and Virginia rail, Sora, those kinds of things, you know, gallinules, coots. And it's showing those two different things in the two graphs for four different marsh types at Long Point. And you can see for Phragmites, there's no bar. They found no marsh nesting species, uh, uh, no individuals of these marsh nesting species at all in the Phragmites. They're just not there. You don't need any statistics to figure this one out. They're just not there. They don't like it. So bad news story uh, here for marsh nesting birds. Phragmites is bad news for this group. Now we can move on, take a look at non-native invasive zebra and coaga mussels. Um, these things were introduced from Eurasia, dumped out in ship ballast water. Um, you, know, you get these large container ships coming across the Atlantic. They take on ballast water before they leave their home port because they need to be weighted down and balanced in the open ocean on their way here. And when they get here, they dump the water out, including the mussels, and you get these uh, non-native species here. And you can see from the map, they've spread throughout the lower Great Lakes and Lake Huron quite extensively. The problem for birds with these mussels is that before the mussel invasion, various species of ducks, especially scop and bufflehead especially, mostly ate snails. Um, and the nice thing about snails is they eat vegetation and they don't accumulate contaminants and pollutants very much. But of course, once those mussels came along, these groups of ducks switched over almost completely to the mussels. I mean, if you think about it, mussels are really good to eat if you're some of the, in some of these groups of ducks, if you're some of these species of ducks. I'd switch over too if I were them. I mean, all of a sudden, they're easy to find, they're all over the place, they're high protein. I mean, I'd eat them too. And like I say, some of these uh, groups switched over almost completely. The thing with mussels is they're incredibly efficient filter feeders. So the way they make their living is they filter the water column through their siphon and take out all kinds of little goodies that are suspended in the water to eat, including all kinds of pollutants and contaminants. So they're really good filter feeders and they, their tissues get um, filled with all these nasty things. And of course these ducks eat the mussels and you have biomagnification and now you have all the junk, so to speak, in the ducks. And the concern was, are these species and groups of species of ducks that have switched over almost completely to the mussels, are they taking on too much of certain pollutants and is this having a negative effect on their survival and reproduction and their health? And one uh, contaminant in particular was selenium. 
Selenium was found at especially high levels in the mussels and subsequently in the ducts. Selenium is a naturally occurring element. All vertebrates actually need it for various cell functions. At a low dose, it's a good thing. But at a higher dose, like was thought was happening with the ducts, it can cause all kinds of physiological problems. So uh, part of this story focused especially on selenium. And to illustrate the extent of the problem, this graph shows density and biomass of zebra and quagga mussels combined for Lake Erie over the years. And you can see at one point, they really peaked at phenomenal numbers, like up there around three or 4,000 mussels per square meter. I mean, if you're not into metric, a square meter, I don't know, it's, it's roughly the size of the slide there, a little bit, it's a little bit smaller than the slide. Imagine 3,000 mussels. I mean, yes, these things are small. Here's a bunch coating this shoe that was underwater. But still, three or 4,000 mussels per square meter, across, on average across a lot of the shallower part of the lake is a lot of mussels. And you, know, you get a sense of the, the, the extent of the problem if you consider this map at the bottom, right, that's showing satellite tracks of migrating scop as they come south from their boreal breeding grounds. And you can see from this huge wide area, they all funnel right through the Great Lakes. Uh, and they stop here and eat a bunch of mussels and potentially take on a bunch of these contaminants in their tissues. And so you've got you know, hundreds of thousands of these ducks potentially uh, taking on this nasty stuff. Now interestingly enough, Bird Studies Canada conducted quite a bit of research in the past to look at this issue, and especially selenium in particular. And we won't take time to go into the particulars of each of the studies, but suffice it to say, we used a variety of different observational and experimental techniques to discover that yes indeed, when these migrating waterfowl stop during migration, they do eat a lot uh, take on a lot of contaminants of various different kinds, including selenium especially, and those things do reach higher levels. But get this, the research showed that they don't reach a level high enough to have significant bad effects. <laughs> a good news story for once. And trust me, these researchers really tried a variety of different angles. They wanted to find a negative effect, and they just didn't find it, including one very clever experiment that actually brought scop into captivity, kept them in large pools in a facility south of Elmer, and dosed them with low, medium, and high doses of selenium as found in the wild, and was able to measure experimentally whether there's uh, effects on survival and reproduction, or sorry, not reproduction, but survival, and there were veterinarians collaborated with on this study and looked at a whole suite of different health measures in the ducts, in the different doses. So things like oxidative stress in cells and immune function and you know, you name it, liver components, all kinds of stuff. There were no differences. Even the high dose with the high, high dose of selenium, no differences, no health effects. So we gotta go with the evidence we've got. If you can't find you know the negative effects, they just aren't there. This looks like it's not a big deal uh, for these muscle eating ducks. So eat away, duckies. You can eat your zebra and quagga mussels. It apparently, with the uh, evidence we have, is not a bad thing. Okay, how about that last one? Type B botulism and its effects on loons and other waterfowl. So type B botulism, unlike the other two, this is a, a, a native, naturally occurring thing. Botulism bacteria are found in sediments throughout the Great Lakes. They're natural, They're so, you know, they, they weren't brought there by humans. And for the most part, these bacteria are dormant a lot of the time. But when they get active, they start metabolizing and they produce the botulism toxin. And two factors that get them active are shown here. Warm temperatures and along with it, usually by definition, lower oxygen. And especially like no oxygen conditions. So you raise the temperature, you take away the oxygen, they get happy, they metabolize, and they produce botulism toxin. And the problem with the toxin is it's really potent. It's a potent, potent neurotoxin. Um, you know, you remember back to high school biology class, you have a nerve, and where one nerve connects to the next one, there's a synapse, and you gotta have certain chemicals jump across the synapse to carry the nerve impulse on down the line, and move a muscle, or do whatever. The thing with the botulism toxin is it, it, it blocks that, those chemicals from making that connection. 
So you get enough uh, of this toxin in a vertebrate, like this loon, um, it basically gets paralyzed because it can't, those nerve impulses aren't making their way across synapses. Can't move its muscles, can't feed itself, can't move, and basically starves to death. And this common loon washed up on the beach at Long Point years ago um, and had died from botulism. Now, the extent of this problem is a little harder to pinpoint than, than the other two that we've talked about. Um, what you see up there in the top left is a record of botulism killed water birds from around the entire uh, edge of Lake Erie over the years. And you can see it bounces all over the place. Like in 2002 or whatever it is there, you know, 20,000 waterfowl in total found dead from botulism on beaches around the lake. And that's just the ones that washed ashore. You don't really know what proportion die and, and drown and go to the bottom and don't wash up on beaches. So 20,000 could just be some unknown fraction of the total kill. And then other years, there's hardly anything. And the pattern also really varies spatially, too. Sometimes the outbreaks in the past, especially, have been in the western basin. More recently, they seem to be mostly in the eastern basin. Everything to do with type B botulism and water birds in Lake Erie and the other Great Lakes is all, it's shrouded in a lot of mystery. There's a lot of unknowns with this one. We don't really know yet what really fuels different uh, outbreaks of type B botulism. We're, we're not very good at predicting when and where it will happen because I don't think we really understand yet how this works. But potentially, you know, in some years, this potentially is a bad news story. You got 20,000 waterfowl uh, washing up on the beach. That's an unknown portion of some larger kill. That's probably going to have some population level effects. Now, there's all kinds of hypotheses to explain what's causing type B botulism outbreaks in Lake Erie. Here's just four of the major ones. And I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but I'm going to try and quickly describe each of them. There's the climate change hypothesis, the invasive muscle hypothesis. The Cladophora hypothesis, which is a type of algae that grows down on the bottom in parts of the lake where light can reach down to the bottom. And then the round goby hypothesis. And of course, round gobies, you've heard a lot about these in the media lately, probably. This is another one of these non-native invasive species that's been introduced here from Eurasia. And luckily, this one eats mussels. It's eating zebra and quagga mussels like crazy because it specializes in eating mussels. So quickly, the way this works, climate change, some scientists say, remember back to the first slide there about botulism. Higher temperatures, lower oxygen, gets them active, produces botulism toxins. Some scientists say, well, we got climate change, we're heating up the lake. By definition, higher temperatures mean lower oxygen. There you go, there's your botulism outbreaks. Okay, you know, you can buy that. Maybe that's part of the, the, the equation. The invasive muscle hypothesis, some scientists say, well, you got all these muscles that are all over the place. Um, they're incredibly efficient, efficient filter feeders. They're probably filtering the uh, bacteria and the toxin out of the water, concentrating it, biomagnifying it uh, in their tissues. You got your muscle-eating ducks that have switched over. In stock, for example, almost 100% during stopover, during migration. They're gonna, you know, the, the mussels eat the contaminated, or the ducks eat the contaminated mussels, biomagnifies up one more step in the food chain, boom, there, that's how you're getting your botulism toxin in your ducks, and that's where you're getting your kill. Okay, fair enough, that makes sense. The Cladophora hypothesis, this one's really kind of complicated, and it interacts a lot with the muscle hypothesis. So this one says, we know we've got more Cladophora growing in the lake in recent years. Mostly, probably, because the mussels are such good filter feeders. They filter so much stuff out of the water, the water is much more clear, lets more light down to the bottom of the lake, where this stuff likes to grow. Therefore, it has more places to grow, because there's more light, and that's why we have increases in Cladophora. We have more Cladophora, more of it dies in big, huge mats in late summer, which is when you have the botulism outbreaks. When you have these big mats of rotting algae, you get low oxygen, higher temperatures, Boom, that gets your botulism bacteria active, creates botulism toxin, probably some of it gets transferred into invertebrates that aren't infected by the toxin, then the fish eat the invertebrates, now you have the toxin, and you can down up the line, and that's maybe one way how it gets into fish-eating ducks. Because there's merganzers, uh, which only eat 
fish for the most part that are in these uh, birds that wash up on the on the beaches as well. So not just mussel eating ducks that are affected by this. So. And of course, loons eat fish, and they're part in part of the kill too. And there's some evidence that suggests that the mussels are also concentrating nutrients in their feces that also fuels the cadophora um, growing in the mussel beds, and that's where the mussels or the mussel eating ducks pick up. Anyway, that's sort of how the Cladophora hypothesis works. And then the round goby hypothesis says, okay, you got these contaminated mussels with the botulism toxin in it. The gobies come along, they eat the contaminated mussels, biomagnifies them to the fish. The fish are partially paralyzed. They're easy pickings. Loons like to go for easy stuff. And now you've got it into fish eating ducks. Anyway, probably all four are working in concert. And probably there's other hypotheses and mechanisms that cause botulism outbreaks that we haven't even thought of yet that are also <laughs> acting. As I just mentioned before, a lot of this stuff is really complicated. A lot of interacting factors. Um, but the, the overall story is type B botulism, probably a bad news story at a population level, um, and shrouded in mystery. We don't really, we're not very good yet at predicting where and when these outbreaks occur. A lot more work to do on this one. Okay, now we can move on. Um, let's, you know, we've seen what causes each of those three stressors. We took a look at how it in, uh, influences individual birds. Now we can take a quick look and use some of the citizen science data to see if there's population level effects across many different individuals in each of the three species groups. And we can use these three citizen science programs here. So first one, you know, effective frag mites on marsh nesting birds. This is some marsh monitoring program data. On the left, you're looking at uh, trends in occurrence or occupancy of different marsh nesting species in the southern portion of the Great Lakes Basin. And the details are, are not necessarily relevant, but you can see circled in red there, a little over half those species are significantly declining over time. On the right, same kind of information, again from the Marsh Monitoring Program, but you're looking at abundance over the years um, in Great Lake and Lake Erie coastal marshes specifically. So rather, the left-hand set of uh, graphs is for the southern Great Lakes Basin as a whole. The right-hand set of graphs is for Lake Erie specifically. And the same kind of story, the players change a little bit, but about half those of those species are significantly declining, shown by the red circles. And I would say it's probably a pretty good bet that these uh, declines in these species are at least partially caused by Phragmites being a bad news story for marsh nesting species. So we knew it was a bad news story, and yes, it seems to be a bad news story at a population level too. How about the mussel uh, story? For this, we can use Christmas bird count data. As you can see in the map up in the top left-hand corner there, um, those are Christmas bird count circles that partially overlap the lake. And the data I put in these four graphs um, are just total uh, observed sums of those four different uh, species or groups of species around the whole lake. And so Christmas bird count data, many of you are really familiar with this program, um, this gives us a snapshot of how many of these different groups are using the lake during late uh, fall, early winter, stopover, or overwintering on the lake. So what I've done here, the two at the top, the two graphs at the top, the one on the left is for scop, the two species combined, and the one on the right is for buffalhead. And um, we know for sure that scop have switched over almost 100% to eating mussels during migratory stopover here and while overwintering. Um, and I was surprised somewhat to learn that buffleheads eat a lot of mussels too, at least according to the diet studies that I looked at. In contrast, the two bottom graphs, the, the left-hand one is for all mergansers combined, and of course they eat mostly fish. And the bottom right-hand one is for common gold mine, which according to the diet studies I looked at, don't eat as many mussels as buffleheads do, which I was quite surprised at. They eat more, according to the studies that, that I happen to look at, they eat more um, crustaceans um, during stopover and overwintering than mussels. So basically the top graphs are groups that eat mussels and the bottom graphs are not. And you can see up until the mussel invasion, stock were 
not very abundant at all, according to these data, and same for bufflehead. And then as soon as the muscle evasion occurred, their numbers skyrocketed and have continued to skyrocket. Whereas in contrast, our fish eaters down here and our mostly crustacean eaters, you don't get that same pattern. So this suggests that yes, you know, population level effects here for our mostly muscle eating uh, species, but Luckily, as we saw before, this seems to be a good news story. And even though there's more and more of these things stopping here during uh, migration and overwintering and eating these mussels, it doesn't seem to be having any major uh, bad negative effects on these species. So a good news story, we can let these numbers skyrocket and feel warm and fuzzy about it. Okay, and how about that last one? Type B botulism. Of course, like I said before, everything about type B botulism is complicated and shrouded in mystery. Um, we can use Canadian Lakes Loon Survey data to try and look at a population level effect for type B botulism. Um, now, the, the Loon Survey is not very well designed for various reasons for measuring numbers of loons. The total number of breeding loons seems to be stable or even increasing in some places over time. But what we can use the loon survey for, and what it's really designed to do, is to measure the number of chicks that adults produce on the breeding grounds. Now right away, some of you are probably saying, what does the number of chicks that are produced on the breeding grounds that are well north of Lake Erie and north of the other uh, lower Great Lakes, what does that have to do with type B botulism? But let me explain just briefly. Think about this. You've got these loons breeding on these breeding lakes in central Ontario, shown by the dots on the map. You've got adults there, they migrate south in the fall, they stop on Lake Erie, they stop on Lake Ontario, some of them get killed by botulism. That means that the following spring, their territories are going to be vacant because they're not going to be returning because they're dead. That means that other loons will fill those vacancies. And the way things work in the loon world is those vacancies will almost certainly be filled by younger loons than the ones that die. We know from color-marked individuals that young loons produce fewer chicks because they're less experienced at doing it. So one prediction at a population level might be is if you've got all these loons being killed by botulism on the lakes when they stop over heading south, um, there might be a decrease during botulism years in the number of chicks produced because you've got younger birds the following year producing young. So what I've shown here in the graph are um, the number of young per pair per year over the years for the two different populations, the orange one and the blue one. And the orange one is a guesstimate, and a real speculative guesstimate, I will admit, on my part, as to loons that might stop over on Lake Erie on their southward migration, whereas the blue dots is a population that probably stops over in Lake Ontario. And that's based on banding returns and satellite transmitted birds to make that division. Now, admittedly, it's speculative. So now we can look at the number of chicks uh, for the two different populations over time, and I've put two panels here. One before botulism outbreaks were common on Lake Erie and Lake Ontario, and the next box for after. And you can see, you know, there's not any real strong effects here, but the number of chicks being produced are lower during the botulism panel and lower on the Lake Erie population, in quotes, than the Lake Ontario population. So nothing really obvious here, but interesting and intriguing to think that maybe this dip, especially a little bit after 2002, which was the, one of the highest botulism outbreak years on Lake Erie, you have this dip. It might not have anything to do with botulism, but it might. So as I said, anything to do with type B botulism, shrouded in mystery, there might be population level effects here. Some of this uh, variation may be caused by botulism, but we can't be sure. So probably a bad news story this one. Okay, we've covered a lot here tonight. Let's try and form some conclusions here and tease out some take-home messages. Um, just a real, real quick recap. We saw the Lower Great Lakes most stressed, especially Lake Erie. We saw Lake Erie is really important for nesting and migrating birds. We saw there's a lot of stressors. They really interact in complicated ways with each other. We dealt with that by picking three effective fray mighties on marsh nesting birds, effective contaminated mussels on muscle eating ducks, uh, and the effect of type B botulism on loons and other waterfowl. We looked at you know, individual effects, and then we looked to see if there were population level effects, bottom line, 
Craig Mighty's bad news story, individual and population level. Uh, Muscle eating ducks, good news story at both levels. And typey botulism, basically don't really know much, but probably a bad news story. Now, it's hard to, there, I see at least four main messages coming out of all of that. I think at the highest level, what we've seen here tonight, the evidence and the science, really boils down to these things. As a society, I think it tells us that we really need to be, we really need to manage and prevent problems due to invasive species in Lake Erie and the lower Great Lakes in general. You know, invasive species, just think ragmites, zebra and quagga mussels, round gobies, you know, all those are, are invasive non-native species. So we need to be really careful about that. We also need to be careful about pollutants. You know, just think selenium and the other things that were looked at in the mussel eating ducks and in the mussels. Uh, we need to be really careful about nutrient runoff. We didn't speak about this one directly, but we did talk a little bit about it when we mentioned the three lakes in one and the added phosphorus that you've been hearing a lot about in the news lately and it fueling harmful algal blooms. So we need to be careful about that. And we need to be careful about climate change too, because you know, think botulism. High temperatures, low oxygen, fueling botulism potentially. So it's hard to know, you know what to do about all this, um, especially because you know, what we decide to do as individuals is going to vary from one person to another. Um, but one thing that I do suggest is if tonight, if I've fueled you to go a little further, I mean, these, these uh, uh, issues are really complicated. There's a lot to them. So if you're fueled to learn a little bit more, I highly suggest these sources. Our Federal Environment Commissioner, and especially our Provincial env uh, Environmental Commissioner. If you've never been to the Environmental Commissioner of Ontario website, I highly recommend you go. There's awesome stuff on this website. There's reports on all the issues we've talked about tonight and a whole bunch of others. And the reading is fantastic. I, I call them sort of medium level reports. So they're, they're fairly detailed, but they're, they're, do, they're short enough that they're doable to read a bunch of them at once. And of course, it's a reputable, uh, reliable source of information. And the really nice thing about them is they're very timely. So they, they summarize all the science, similar to the kinds of things we did for three of these issues tonight. But then it also summarizes the current uh, situation with policy and legislation. And then it poses some suggestions as to what we should probably do as a society about these issues, um, which is really handy uh, for these really complicated issues. So I really suggest you check that out. And then these other uh, sources of information as well, Freshwater Future Canada, Freshwater Alliance, very similar names there, but they've got some great resources along the same kind of lines, and their Lake Erie Alive uh, initiative. I also really recommend, if I've fueled your interest to go further tonight, to check out Dan Egan's recent book. This just came out earlier this year. It's a fantastic read, The Death and Life of the Great Lakes, Dan is a journalist by trade, so the writing is fantastic. This book overviews everything we've talked about tonight, plus a whole lot of other things, and some really interesting history about how things have changed over a longer time period than we talked about uh, tonight in the, in the lakes. So, at that point, I hope I've fueled you to take a closer look and dive into these complicated issues a little bit further, um, if you haven't already. And then at that point, I'm hoping that you might consider maybe these three courses of action. We could change our behavior. There's a lot of things that all of us can do as individuals, especially in terms of you know reducing your footprint for fueling climate change, or how you contribute to phosphorus going into the lake, or moving invasive species around. There's, there's lots of individual things we can do that way. We can also educate others. Think about this. The Christmas party season is upon us. And if you're like me, and many of you won't be lucky, but if you're like me, at Christmas parties, you will be looking for small talk. And now you can talk all about the issues in the lower Great Lakes while you're at the party. So that, and, and of course, you know, in a more serious way, you know, educate your kids and, and your friends and your neighbors and everybody else, because everybody really should know about this stuff. And then maybe just maybe you might be 
uh, you might consider and be fueled at that point to engage your political leaders. And this, this doesn't mean you have to march up to them with a sign and you know be aggressive. Just talk to your political leaders. They want to hear from you. They want to, you can just have a chat with them and let them know, hey, birds are important and these stressors and how they're affecting birds and everything else in the lake are really important to you. And that can go a long way uh, farther than you might think. So, thank you very much for listening. I hope that I've fueled your passion for the Great Lakes. I know many of you are, are passionate about these, uh, these places already. But I hope from what you've seen here tonight, you, you want to learn more, you want to get engaged more, and that you, you, I hope you'll want to join, if you haven't joined already, the masses of people that are really getting into looking after the Great Lakes and the birds and the other wildlife that they support. Thank you very much.